Hi, my name is Michelle Cashman and I'm the librarian in the Local Studies Department of Sligo County Library. This presentation is to commemorate Frank Carty's escape from Sligo Jail on the 26th of June 1920. There will be a talk by Porig Dignan, historian and published author, and this will be accompanied by material from the Local Studies Department and other sources. Frank Carty was a very influential man in Sligo and the North West, and his daring escapes were covered in all the local newspapers of the day. He went on to become successful in local and national politics. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Frank Carty was one of the most colourful and fascinating characters involved in the revolutionary period in Sligo. He was a highly motivated and energetic Tubber Battalion Commander and Vice Commander of the Sligo Brigade of the IRA during the War of Independence. And he was almost impossible for the authorities to arrest and imprison. During the year 1920, Carty was involved in numerous attacks. On the 20th, 20th of February, a daylight raid on the house of Colonel Alexander Percival in Temple House in Sligo yielded a few weapons and swords. Mrs Percival and her children were present during the raid she later identified a well-dressed Frank Carty as the ringleader. Actually, the dapper dresser was Jim Hunt. 19 men were arrested within the week, but of those placed behind bars, only Frank Carty was involved in the attack. He was sentenced in April and he was incarcerated in Sligo Jail. Carty was such an inspirational commander and of such vital importance to the military campaign in Sligo that the IRA were determined to spring him from jail and one of the most daring and spectacular operations in Sligo during the War of Independence. On the night of the 26th of June, 1920, Billy Pilkington, commanding officer of the Sligo Brigade, summoned experienced men from all around the county. Their mission was to break into Sligo jail and spring Frank Carty. Carty had heard that his trial was going to be transferred from Sligo to Derry, and he held out no hope of acquittal there. He communicated plans for his escape to Pilkington and both he and Seamus Devins, Sligo Battalion Intelligence Officer, were in charge of the rescue. According to Michael Nevin, Stephen O'Connor, a warder in Sligo Jail, carried messages between Carty and Pilkington. O'Connor, he'd been a member of the Volunteers in Dublin while he worked in Mountjoy Jail before being transferred to Sligo. Altogether, about 53 men were involved in a well-planned and well-executed operation. Two cars carried 10 men from South Sligo to assist in the rescue. Among those from the Tubbercarry area were Mick O'Hara, who had been selected as commander in place of, of Carty, and Jack Brennan. From Colooney came Frank O'Byrne and Harry Brenny, while from Ballymoat came Taddy McGowan. They stopped south of the cemetery, just outside Sligo, and made their way on foot through the fields towards the prison. At a prearranged spot, they met their comrades from Sligo Town and from North Sligo. Only half a mile from the jail, stood a military barracks and two police barracks, and a sizable military and police presence could have been at the jail within minutes. To counter this possibility, outposts of the Sligo town companies guarded the approach roads to the jail. The men from South Sligo who were met by Pilkington acquainted them with the plans. Now long ladders had been uh, hidden near the jail earlier uh, in the evening, and they were used to climb the walls. Rope ladders would be used to get down inside. Tom Scanlon's duty that night was to ensure the safety of the men getting over the wall and getting back over the wall once they released Carty. He organised the taking of large gates from Kilgallen's to block the road towards the jail. About 20 men with sledges and picks took up position near the main gate. Another 20 outpost duty. The telephone wire was cut leading to the jail. 13 men climbed the ladder and went inside, while two men held the ladder. Harry Conroy was the first over the wall, followed by Jack Brenny and Mick O'Hara. Brennan and O'Hara would make sure that the alarm bell remained silent. Inside, the night patrolman and the warder in charge of the alarm were overpowered. Five men led by Devons went into the governor's office, got the keys, tied up the governor and proceeded to release Carty from his cell. The men now had to get out, and Pilking decided that using the rope ladder would take too long, so he signalled for the doors to be smashed in. You could hear the noise all over the town, Jack Brennan later said. 
the rescuers made good their escape. Pilkington asked the South Sligo men where would be the best place to hide Carty, and they suggested the Clunacool area as it was remote. Carty was driven there. The rescue was completed by one o'clock. There was no military activity at that time. In fact, it was so quiet, Tom Scannon later said, we could have carried the jail away stone by stone. Some hours later, the alarm was raised and a truckload of soldiers dashed towards the jail, colliding with the iron gates that were earlier placed across the road, injuring two soldiers. They were the only injuries on the night. Yes, genial Frank Carty's the pick of them all, who meets him in combat is sure of a fall. He is out of his cell and over the wall, why the devil of prison can hold him at all. In the coming months, Carty continued to cause setbacks to British forces in the Sligo area. On the 31st of August, Carty and two other volunteers opened fire on an RIC patrol just about to enter the barracks in Tubbercurry. Two policemen were injured. On the 30th of September, 21-year-old District Inspector James Brady became a victim during an attack and ambush at Chaffpool, about three miles from Tubbercurry. Frank Carty and about 13 other men opened fire on an RIC truck. Brady and Constable O'Hara were reported to have been shot by dum dum bullets. In reprisal, the RIC and the Black and Tans burned several businesses in Tubbercurry, including the Creamery. Carty was finally rounded up in November 1920. This time he was sent to what authorities would thought would be a far more secure facility, Derry Jail. A prisoner for but a few months, in February 1921, Frank Carty made another one of his famous jailbreaks with the assistance of a native of Derry, Charlie McGuinness. McGuinness, with the help of a friendly warder, smuggled in a hacksaw and a ball of twine and told Carty to get transferred to the hospital unit. Carty feigned back injuries and he was transferred to the hospital wing. He managed to sneak to the back wall, threw the twine over the wall, they attached the rope ladder to the wall and the rest, as they say, was easy. He is free. Let his keepers divide the blame. His spirit they fail to crush or tame. Others may barter Ireland's claim, but Frank's opinions are still the same. Carty was taken to several safe houses in Derry before he sailed to Scotland, where he spent some time lecturing and training the Glasgow IRA men. In late April, after his presence became known to the authorities, he was arrested. The Glasgow volunteers realised there was no hope of rescuing Frank Carty from the infamous jail in Glasgow. It was a tough, secure facility guarded by loyal warders. Instead, they hashed a plan to snatch him in broad daylight on the streets of Glasgow while he was being moved between the jail and the courthouse. The scheme required split-second timing, perfect communication between the various units and of course a lot of luck. Unfortunately, however, on the day, nothing went right for the IRA and Carty went back to jail. He was sentenced to 10 years and he was transferred to Mountjoy Jail in Dublin. By the beginning of the Civil War, in June 1922, Frank Carty had been released from prison during the truce. And this time he was plotting against free state troops. On the 1st of July, the market house in Colony was attacked by units under Frank Carty's command. The next day, there was a meeting in Sligo Town between all the divisional commanders about what to do after the attack on the four courts. Some commanders suggested that they attack south towards Athlone Barracks, while others north towards the border. Frank Carty wished to attack free troops, free state troops within Sligo. And being the man he was, he took independent action. He attacked the important position of Colony, took the town, ejected the Free State troops and held it for a week and a half. In August, Carty's unit lured a group of 45 national soldiers out of Tubbercurry and ambushed them. One Free State trooper was killed, others were injured and a haul of weapons were captured. In November, men under his command engaged national troops on the Mayo-Sligo border and fought a running battle with them into the Ox Mountains, where they managed to escape. Carty continued his attacks on Free State forces 
slippery and as evasive as ever, he eluded capture. However, in January 1925, while he was visiting some friends in County Down, the RUC captured him. He was taken to Newry and later to Crumlin Road Jail in Belfast. A week later, he was released from the prison and transferred into the custody of Free State troops on the border. In addition to his military escapades, Frank Harty was elected to the Dáil in 1921 and he was elected on eight subsequent occasions. He refused to take his seat in the Dáil along with the other anti-treaty members of Sinn Féin and he only walked into the Dáil in August 1927 along with the other founding members of Fianna Fáil. He served as chairman of Sligo County Council from 1928 to 1934. Carty's life was eventful, meaningful and spirited, but his body did not forget or forgive all the years of stress, hardship and combat. And in September 1942, at the age of 45, he died. It is surely fitting to write his name up near the top in the Roll of Fame. We will write his name in letters of gold, the man that never a prison could hold.